Hi class, there's a book titled The Impending Crisis by Dr. David Potter. I can highly recommend it if you want to go a little deeper into the study of the early 19th century in America. For this lecture, I want to try and explain what exactly is the impending crisis in the United States in the early 19th century. We are a fractured and divided nation like no other time before or since. If you think America has division now, you should study the time leading up to the Civil War. I want to share a few of the more revealing events and issues that we faced in the years before the Civil War. Remember Manifest Destiny. In particular, Southerners embraced Manifest Destiny, this ideology that we as the white Anglo-Saxon race are destined by God to own our land, this land, and prosper. We're a superior race. And so after the Louisiana Territory purchase, we sort of thought that the Mexican Territory of Texas came with it. But class, it did not. So we tried to buy it for Mexico, and they said no. However, in 1820, Mexico is going to make a colossal mistake. They had Indian problems like we did, and the Midwesterner Indians, they're, they're a lot more violent, just downright meaner than the Eastern Woodland Indians. So maybe Americans in our Mexican territory of Texas could help us with our Indian problem. This is their way of thinking. And maybe if we allow Americans in our Texas ter territory, they can be a buffer between us, this is Mexico's thought, and the United States government, and hey, maybe these Americans will become loyal to Mexico. So they asked Americans to come, 1820 and on, no taxes for four years, land's cheap, and thousands will go, and they're taking their slaves. Soon they're going to outnumber Mexicans. So this isn't really working out like Mexico planned. Americans begin to create their own centers of power. And one of these groups started a revolt. Well, Mexico put them down and began banning any more Americans from immigrating. But class, it's too late. By 1835, over 30,000 Americans are in Texas. And as friction between the American settlers and Mexico grows over issues like slavery, the Mexican government had made it illegal to have slaves in Texas, instability is going to lead to a leadership change in Mexico. General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana is going to seize power as a dictator. And Mexico will begin to send troops into Texas and fighting will escalate. Now, under American Sam Houston, he's an American settler. He defiantly proclaims independence from Mexico, and Santa Ana is going to lead an army into Texas. Mexican forces annihilate an American garrison at the Alamo Mission in San Antonio. Remember, the Alamo became a rally cry for Americans. Americans managed to keep forces together under Sam Houston, and finally, at the Battle of San Jacinto, near present-day Houston, he defeats the Mexican army and takes Santa Ana prisoner. Under this pressure, Santa Ana signed a treaty giving Texas independence from Mexico. So Houston's gonna send a delegation to apply for statehood. But Andrew Jackson, who's still president, he didn't wanna create any more problems. So he says, I'm just gonna put that off. That is, until England and France started talking to Texas about becoming a colony. So class, in 1844 to 1845, the United States adds Texas as a state. As a state. Okay, after the Texas Revolution, Mexico will break all relations to the United States. We're going to say that the Rio Grande River is our border. They say the Nueces River is. This added more territory to America than Mexico wanted to give up. James K. Polk, who is our president, elected in 1844, says too bad. He sends in troops under Zachary Taylor to protect our borders. Polk is gonna try to buy out Mexico from the Rio Grande to the Nueces River, but they said no. So class, 
we eventually picked a fight and we got it. Polk lied. He said war exists by the act of Mexico herself. By 1846, we are at war. We're going to use this as a training ground for Civil War generals. You'll be hearing a lot of the same names like Ulysses S. Grant, General Robert E. Lee. Grant said this of the Mexican War, this is a wicked, wicked war. Other people spoke out against the war, Abe Lincoln and the like, other politicians, but to no avail. Now simultaneous to all of this, our battles with Mexico over the borders, Polk encourages Americans in California to revolt against Mexico too. You have to understand Mexico owned Texas and the area of New Mexico and Arizona and, and on up into California. So we um, began to orchestrate this revolt in California, The gov our government did, called the Bear Flag Revolt. Again, it's, it's put in place by our government, not necessarily citizens as a whole. Mexico refuses to admit defeat. So with an army of 14,000, our General Winfield Scott will head to Mexico City. We end up invading their capital, but Polk needs to win an election. So he strong arms a negotiated treaty and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago with Mexico. We gain the Rio Grande as our border and a lot of other territory like New Mexico and parts of California. We pay Mexico 15 million for our gained territory. So we gained territory, but we also gained a lot of their citizens and a lot of problems. Now, what's happening in the United States proper? Sectional tensions are going to mount over the termination of allowing slavery in states that are applying to the Union. And that's why I wanted to, to talk a little bit about Mexico, the Mexico War, and us gaining Texas and California. What's going to happen with all of these states? Remember, we're moving further west. We're, we're also, besides Mexico, we've opened up the Oregon Territory. And several areas are going to try to apply for statehood from territories carved out of the Louisiana Purchase. What are we going to do? For the most part, and up to this time, we have an even number of slave states and free states. But our balance is now in question. So to try and keep a better balance, five bills are going to be passed in our nation's capital um, called the Compromise of 1850. This is an attempt to diffuse the years of confrontation between slave states of the South and free states of the North. And the compromise is drafted by Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky and brokered by him and Stephen Douglas. <clears throat> and it'll ultimately settle down talks of secession and settle down talks of civil war that's breaking out over the, the idea of slave states versus free states. Class, the compromise was greeted with some relief, although each side, North and South, intensely dislike specific provisions. Some of the provisions in the uh, compromise are Texas is going to allow New Mexico to be carved out of its uh, territory, <clears throat> and we're gonna settle some Texas boundaries once and for all. California will be admitted as a free state Slave trade is banned in Washington, D.C., but the most contentious part of this act class was a stronger Fugitive Slave Act that the South negotiated. The Fugitive Slave Act had been in place since the 1790s. It's a federal law that we've talked about before that allowed for the capture and return of runaway slaves. The 1850 provision added more you know, details regarding runaways, it levied harsher punishments for interfering with their capture. And this was met by widespread impassioned criticism and resistance in the North. Riots broke out and the Underground Railroad effort will peak during this time. Let me encourage you class to watch the movie Harriet about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and her heroic efforts. It covers this exact time period. I've seen it, it's a very empowering film, so watch it as you, if you can. So, for now, the Compromise of 1850 has settled things down a bit, but not for long. I think this is a great map. 
to give you an idea of how we're dividing ourselves over slavery. Again, the acquisition of, of these new Western lands is raising the question of the status of slavery in new territories, organizing for statehood by the United States, and tensions between the North and the South on this question led to this compromise in 1850. Um, <clears throat> you know, for example, California is going to join the Union as a free state, but we're going to see something um, some idea posed by Stephen Douglas called popular sovereignty for the new territories. What's going to shake the balance again is the idea of popular sovereignty. Let the new states vote on whether or not they want to be a free state or a slave state. So you can see where this is going. The passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 is going to threaten the truce of the Compromise of 1850. It's going to have immediate, sweeping, and ominous consequences. It divides political parties. It leads to politicians switching parties. And it even spurs the idea of a new political party. You can read all about the downfall of the Whigs and the rise of the Republican Party in your textbook. But these events that are going to take place after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act forming this territory are going to lead us directly into civil war. After the passage of this act forming this territory, white settlers from both north and south flood into the area. Now there's going to be about 1,500 legal voters in what we know as Kansas by 1855, and they decide to apply for statehood, and because of this popular sovereignty, they're going to be able to vote to determine if they want to be a free state or a slave state. Most of those in Kansas at this time wanted a free state. However, thousands of Missouri residents who were part of a slave state poured into the region and voted to set up a pro-slavery state and they began to set up their own territorial government. Now, free state supporters are outraged. They held up, they held their own separate elections, and they set up their own government, excluding slavery. They chose a governor, and they petitioned Congress for statehood, the free uh, state. And President Pierce denounces them, and he throws his support to the pro-slavery forces. This is not going to go good. Both sides class are going to be fueled by organizers. Pro-slavery forces go to Kansas State, the free state of Kansas, capital in Lawrence, and they sack the city. They attempt to arrest the free state leaders. They destroy the printing presses. They burn down the governor's house, and retribution is going to come very quickly. Violence begins to spread in the territory. You've got to pick a side and some people are gonna die for it. Pro-slavery proponents are going to be tarred and feathered and kidnapped. And John Brown, a devout abolitionist who resisted, he, he resists talking, we don't need to talk, we need action. He and his followers, that included some of his own sons, murder five pro-slavery settlers leaving their bodies out for public view. Now this massacre was known as the Potawatomi Massacre and further is going to lead to widespread civil strife in Kansas. Bleeding Kansas is a symbol for many of this sectional strife. And if you want to know more about John Brown, I, I pulled a link into Canvas. He's a fascinating individual and you're gonna hear more about him in a moment. But furthering this crisis of the 1850s, furthering what's happening, is going to be an incident in Washington, D.C. Now, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts gave a speech to the U.S. Senate entitled, The Crime Against Kansas. Everybody was talking about Kansas. His speech was militant opposition to slavery. And he referred to a South Carolina senator, Andrew Butler, who was an outspoken advocate of slavery. And Sumner said Butler had and I quote, chosen a mistress 
who though ugly to others is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world is chaste in his sight, the harlot slavery. Now this pointedly sexual reference and viciousness of the speech enraged Southerners. It particularly enraged Butler's nephew, Preston Brooks, who was a member of the House of Representatives from South Carolina. A few days after the speech, Brooks approached Sumner at his desk and using a heavy cane, began beating him repeatedly on the head. Sumner was trapped and, and in his chair, he eventually collapsed unconscious and he will not be able to return to the Senate for four years. Throughout the North, he was a hero, a martyr to the barbaric ways of the South. Preston Brooks was censured by the House and resigned. However, class, he was a hero in the South and he was reelected to his seat. Class, in 1858, another decision is going to lead us even closer to civil war. The Dred Scott case, it determined slaves were not citizens and they had no right. The justice of the Supreme Court Taney ruled slaves are property and the South was ecstatic. Northerners are outraged further and this is going to really deepen the divide and sectional divisions in America. Class, in all ways, the North and the South are beginning to harden toward each other. Each section wants to ensure its own way of life would be dominant. The North believed in free labor and free soil. Slavery is dangerous, they felt, because of what it did to white society. They saw the South as a closed society, backwards and lazy. The South became determined at all costs to preserve their way of life and their economic interests, and above all, their sectional rights over government control. Congressional elections had pitted one Abraham Lincoln against Stephen Douglas, and they participated in a series of famous debates that received national and even international attention. Here was the major question. If slavery cannot be legally excluded from new territories, how can people under popular sovereignty exclude it? How can people vote not to have it <clears throat> if it can't be legally excluded? So Lincoln took the position to oppose slavery, but class, he didn't really believe slaves were capable of living on their own. He wanted to stop the spread of slavery, but not really slavery itself at this time. He felt that it would eventually die a slow, natural death. Now, Lincoln's going to emerge a star on a national level after this debate. And in 1859, another event takes place to horrify the South. John Brown is back, and 18 of his followers seize the United States arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Now, they were quickly put down under the leadership of none other than General Robert E. Lee of the United States Army. But class, this event seemed to convince the South that they could never leave, they could never live peaceably in the Union. They can't live in a Union that doesn't support slavery. War and or secession seems inevitable. Lincoln's going to win the presidency in 1860, and he's, he's only going to win <clears throat> with 39% of the vote because he wasn't even on the ballot in southern states. White Southerners will see this as another part of their hopeless situation. And the process of secession from the Union will begin in earnest only a few weeks after Lincoln takes office. But are we really going to war with our neighbors and our brothers? Let's see what Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind has to say. What do we care if we were expelled from college, Scarlett? The war's gonna start any day now, so we'd have left college anyhow. War, isn't it exciting, Scarlett? You know those four Yankees actually want a war? We'll show them. Fiddle dee dee. War, war, war. This war talk's spoiling all the fun at every part of this spring. I get so bored I could scream. There isn't going to be any war. There's not going to be any war. Why, honey, of course there's going to be a war. If either of you boys says war, just once again, I'll go in the house and slam the door. But Scarlet, don't honey, you want us to have a war? 
Class, Scarlet was wrong. We are indeed going to war. Next time, as usual, keep in touch.